And then this is where it becomes very interesting. When we look at the change, the difference, condos are only up 22% compared to 2019, where single family homes are up 42%. And Paul, if I do really simple math, five years, that's about eight and a half percent annual appreciation for a single family home and four and a half percent for condos. And I know last time we spoke, you talked yeah. about an elevated price path for single family homes. Can you explain what's let's, happening? Let, keep this slide up because let's think about that for a second. Four to five percent annual price appreciation and, you know, kind of in the range, four to five percent. That's, that's a long term trend range. That's mm -hmm. a very, a very common finding if you go back 10 years and even if you go back further and make some adjustments for the bubbles that we've had in the past. But look at the single family um, year to date uh, this year versus year to date a year ago, 4.8%. Single family homes are back in that four to 5% zone, not condos. Market trends and forecasts, outlook for buyers and sellers, key insights from the experts. Welcome to the Hawaii Housing Report with economist Paul Brubaker and Patrick O'Neill. After a slight drop, interest rates are on the rise. The condo market appears to be in a sales slump, creating a buyer's market, while single family homes maintain an elevated price track, clearly in a seller's market. And to help us unpack it all, we have Hawaii economist Paul Brubaker joining us. Paul, thank you so much for making the time to be here today. Aloha, Patrick. Well, Paul, let's start off with interest rates. So last month, the Fed cuts the Fed fund rate by 50 basis points. The bond market rallies. Mortgage interest rates drop below 6%. There's much rejoicing. Yay. And now over the past few weeks, the rates have increased back over 6%, oh. appear to be heading up. What's going on? It's just the roller coaster of life. I'll drop. So we went down, but now we're going back up, and then we'll go down, and then we'll go up, and then we'll go down. And we're... So if you look at this sequence over, you know, the next three years, you would say, okay, rates are going down. And a good example of this, if I, um, this kind of moving around, snaking around all over the place, is not just happening in interest rates. Um, I don't know why, but the local media don't even report this. They could have had this great story about how inflation nationwide came down and you can see inflation bouncing around trying to get to that. Here's here's the landing field, two and a half percent for the consumer price index. And US inflation went up for 18 months. It came down for 18 months. And right about here, Anders Hostelly and I were saying, oh yeah, rates are gonna come down like in about two months. And a year later, we're at, Oh, yeah. That sounds like you your uh, your Joe Biden uh, <laughs> impersonation there. You can see how it keeps bouncing and almost getting there. Well, here's the news the local media missed out. This rise in Hawaii, that's FEMA paying $10,000 a month to get wildfire victims out of hotels and into houses when Maui County hasn't let anybody build 2,000 houses. So, right. Um, but even even that inflation is coming down now. It's a one time thing in the housing market. And because of that, you, you have to remember on the way up, let's follow the 10 year yield, the heavy black line here. Let's follow the 10 year yield over the, you know, the pandemic and post pandemic recovery. So you can see the 10 year go up and back down and go up and back down and go up and down, go up and go up. And, go up and so was it going up or was it going down? Yes, it was going up and it was going down, but the underlying trend was up. Now it's coming down and you know what's happened since I made this chart like one week ago or something, or, you know, <laughs> September, when did I make this? End of September, what is it today? The 20th. So three weeks ago, I made this graph and where's the 10 year yield today? Right up in here, 420. And that, that whole zigzaggy thing, and you know what is probably gonna end up at around three and a half to four percent, the ten-year yield right now is probably in the zone of its permanent. The rest of you know, if you look at the two-year, the three-year, the five-year, four percent the figure. You look at the seven, which used to be higher than the ten-year, now it's under the ten-year. So 
at the long end of the yield curve where we price these mortgages, the rates are the mm -hmm. risk free rates are pretty much in alignment with what you'd call the neutral rate overnight okay. at three percent, long term at four percent. I got you. So what you're saying is this, it's almost, I think, a half a point raise is just part of that oscillation. But the part of longer term trend is we're heading down, we're going down. It, there's going to be little ups and downs along the way. The Fed busted a big move downward in September and everybody went, oh, let's all jump off the cliff together. And then guess what's at the bottom of the cliff? A trampoline. So now they're bouncing back up. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so it's just going to be like, like that. Your, like, your, I like your, I like your images. They're very good today. Um, <laughs> oh, 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 boy. <laughs> <laughs> Let's bring in uh, Anders Hostelli, a state manager for Rate Mortgage. And Anders, we're talking about the 30-year fixed. Mm -hmm. When you're looking at your <laughs> rate sheet right now, where are we with a 30-year vanilla loan fixed? Yeah, I, just, I always kind of do like 25% down, somebody with really good credit, owner-occupied. It's about six and a half-ish with one point cost. Uh, yeah, and that was, I know last month, right? Because we did this in the middle of September. It was about 5.875, 5.80, something like that. So yeah, mortgage rates, you know, to what Paul is saying, you know, they, they came down and they just did this bump, you know, this, this bounce up. Um, right. So it's about That's a, a big, I mean, it's a big bounce, a half a, a percent. Half percent. Yeah, a little half a percent rate, yeah. Yeah. So I know this is a tough question and you're probably hearing it all the time. What advice do you have for buyers regarding when should I lock in my rate? Like, yeah, what, you know what, what do you say? This is interesting because I, we just had a sales meeting last week and I was uh, reminding all the loan officers because I've seen it in the, you know, over time, I, I see very successful loan officers that are they're very good at you know, consulting, talking to their borrowers, you know, advising and locking and, you know, what I've seen over the years, it's always best to just say, hey, Patrick, you know, if you see a rate that's really good, you should just lock it in um, and just just be safe with it. Uh, it's there instead of trying to gamble. Uh, and there's there's been some people that have gambled recently where they're like, hey, I think rates are going to keep coming down or I like the rate that it was two weeks ago. Yes. I'm going to wait. And then the rates went up even more. Um, right. So yeah, to me, it's that's the big challenge. Like, yeah, that, exactly. that really is the yeah. challenge. Yeah, and and Anders, um, there was a big spread between the thirty-year conventional rate mm -hmm. and the VA last right. month. What? Where is the VA right now in their thirty-year? Yeah, so the VA, like with one point, um, it would be it's like around five point six percent. Oh, uh, I yeah, see. So, so it's still a pretty big spread between it's the still two. A big spread, right? Uh, so yeah, if you're you know a veteran or you can you know you can you know you know or active duty or you know you qualify for a VA loan, it's the best loan possible. Yeah, and not only because of interest rates, because you know you don't have to put a down payment and it's you know yes. easy to qualify for. Okay, and what about uh, the adjustable rate mortgages? How do they compare uh, to the thirty-year fix? Yeah, they're still lower uh, than a thirty-year fix. Uh, we don't see too many people um, locking in on a on a arm right now. Um, so, and I, you know, even, even in the last few years, there really hasn't been a lot of arm activity. It's you know, people see. kind of focus on the 30 year fixed. Yeah. Well, that makes sense. I think we're all expecting rates to, uh, to continue down. And then Anders, any noticeable change in the metrics that you look at rate locks, loan originations? So, I mean, the last couple of weeks, it's definitely slowed down a little bit. Uh, we did have quite a nice, you know, a bit of activity end of august almost all of september because mortgage rates you know when they dropped we had a lot of clients that were waiting to you know refinance so there was a there was you know in, in our business we said well we had this like little mini refi boom for about 30 days uh you know so because mm -hmm. there were people that had locked in we closed loans in the last year well over seven percent so we were able to uh, refinance those clients uh, so yeah okay that, that was nice so hope we're hoping well, to come to down again <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Well, I hate to even ask you this because oh. I hate to ask you this because oh. who knows where do you think rates are going to be December of this year? And this is just Anders. This isn't. No, no, no. It's just me, but... and I know, and I'm usually dead yeah. wrong. It's been like even <laughs> that, right? <laughs> we're both like, yeah, too much. Uh, you know, rates. I think will probably be around where they're at now. Maybe a little bit lower, but um, I, I don't think we're going to see any. You know, substantial drop in rates. Okay. We're kind of hoping a few months ago we would be seeing. 
Right. And would you agree with Paul's assessment that this is sort of just a, an oscillation, a hiccup along the way, but we are heading in an environment where we'll see rates continually drop, let's say, over the next six to 12 months? Yeah, I, I, I do. I do agree with him. Uh, I like his explanation. I mean, we're in the thick of it, Patrick, you and I, like, you know, with buyers, transactions. So sometimes we don't kind of see it when you kind of take a step back. And like, yeah, you can, you know, historically, you can see what, what mortgage rates do. So, yes. Uh, but, yeah. yeah we're, All right. We're well, great. Anders. Yeah. Anders, thank you very much uh, for making the time. Mm -hmm. Really appreciate when you come on and be able to give uh, real world information. Um, it's it's so helpful. And thanks for all the updates throughout the week. So we thank will you. catch you next month. But thanks again. See you next month. Thanks. All right. OK. And we'll be right back with economist Paul Brubaker. And we're going to take a look at the housing stats. So stand by. All right, let's shift gears. I mentioned at the top that the condo sales appear to be in a slump, creating a buyer's market. Yeah. So let's take a moment and we're going to shift, look at the data from the Honolulu Board of Realtors. Okay, Paul, and we are looking at active listings for sale. This is the latest data from the Honolulu Board of Realtors. And we start with single family homes. Compared to last month, inventory is relatively flat. Compared to 2023, there are 30% more homes on the market, certainly good news for buyers. Compared to 2022, there's 20%. If we go all the back, all the way back to pre-pandemic September, down 50%. So it's still a significant shortage in the single family home market. But this is where the real interesting part comes on. When we start to look at condos, active listings for sale, compared to 2023, there's nearly 60% more condos for sale. And compared to 2022, 65% more condos. When we look at 2019, almost getting back, it's only down about 20%. But this is really the big pileup of inventory. Um, yeah. Can you talk to this a little bit and, and what you see as the causes? And, you know, it's it's not down nearly as much compared to September 19 as single family homes are. So it has, it, right. Um, there's, um, there, there are things that are unique to condos that are uh, creating problems. Right off the top, there's the vintage thing. The most, you know, 80%, I think is the number of the condos in Honolulu, the, 80% of the high rises in Honolulu were built by 1981 so there's just a vintage thing where buildings are of an age where the maintenance and operating costs are are not just problematic but they they sort of accumulate right the problems you have at age 30 or age 40 are different problems from the one you have at you know with a new condo or a 10 year old uh, building and then of course the insurance crisis we've had a pattern of catastrophic uh, natural disasters, you know, possibly rooted in in uh, climate change and the evolution of of um, atmospheric uh, greenhouse gas loading. But either way, um, insurance risk exposure has gone up. The insurance industry spent a lot of the last 10 years not earning a lot of interest because interest rates were low. And that's where they build up the ability to pay out when claims are made. And then we had this bombardment of wildfires and hurricanes and then another hurricane i mean what's going on in florida and mm -hmm. i mean north carolina so it's just been one thing after another and it's all happening at the same time yeah and this is a, uh, a little graphic that we put together you know just showing the the shaky three legs let's say the insurance the Actually, uh, there's a fourth fees. leg i see back there thankfully but yes Definitely yeah. a weak foundation. And I hate to say it, but definitely with respect to, you know, the risk, catastrophic risk exposure is really more probable and more costly. So insurance is not going to get cheaper soon. Yeah. Right. And, and I'll say to anybody watching this, if you're not aware of the insurance issue, Take a look at the video that we did with Sue Savio, who does underwrite so many insurance policies across the state. 
Um, I'll, I'll leave a link in the description down below, but it is every single person need to know that buyer, sellers, realtors, you need to know that information, understand what's happening. And you Patrick, mentioned the, yes. Let me uh, just give you a feel for if you, if you smoothed out the seasonal variation, how much this jump in condo inventories wow. uh, uh, differs from what's been happening in the single family home space. So there's, like I say, there's definitely something specific to condos that's at work out there in the housing market. Yeah. Hi, this is Patrick. If you're enjoying this information, please consider giving us a thumbs up below and be sure to subscribe so you don't miss next month's housing report. Okay, let's uh, let's jump over then and let's take a look at prices of single family homes and condominiums. Okay, and Paul, this is the latest information from the Honolulu Board of Realtors. We're going to look at median pricing. Um, you can see uh, single family homes, 1.1 and change, up about 4.5%, nearly 5% compared to last year, down slightly from 2022. But if we look at pre pandemic, we can see single family homes are up 42% over five years. On the condo side, we see 517 median price, flat, up 1% compared to last year, flat, 0% change compared to 2022. And then this is where it becomes very interesting. When we look at the change, the difference, condos are only up 22% compared to 2019, where single family homes are up 42%. And Paul, if I do really simple math, five years, that's about eight and a half percent annual appreciation for a single family home and four and a half percent for condos. And I know last time we spoke, you talked yeah. about an elevated price path for single family homes. Can you explain what's let's, happening? Let's keep this slide up because let's think about that for a second. Four to five percent annual price appreciation and you know kind of in the range four to five percent that's, that's a long-term trade range that's mm -hmm. a very a very common finding if you go back 10 years and even if you go back further and make some adjustments for the bubbles that we've had in the past but look at the single family um year to date uh this year versus year to date a year ago 4.8 percent single family homes are back in that four to five percent zone not condos. And again, we have a really sharp distinction. Um, now, it suggests because the year to date versus 2019 is up so much more for single family homes that something's happening to single family homes that's not happening in condos. And if we could switch to my screen, uh, Patrick, if you could drop out, I'll show yeah. you how on a month, we were looking at year to date numbers, but here on a monthly basis, right up through September, and I've adjusted for the seasonality. So you can see, again, that longer term 20 teens, four to 5% appreciation rate in single family. Condos actually were closer to 5% uh, uh, appreciation in the 20 teens. But after the pandemic, this jump in single family didn't really play out in as you know large a fashion and in condos and they've gone sideways since. It's as if condos are kind of being left in the dust. Now, relatively speaking, condos are kind of a bargain. If you can get one that's not plagued by insurance, maintenance, and, and old age problems. So there's another tip for maybe younger buyers who are looking for an entry, you know, an entry into the housing market. When you yes. when you take out the inflation, right? So let's say half the market, single family, has experienced this post-pandemic jump, maybe a remote work-related jump, and now is on a parallel path while condos are not, there's that 4 to 5% trajectory we were seeing in the 2023 to 2024 comparison, not shared by condos. And when you put the two together and adjust for inflation and then put it in this longer-term context, so you take the 4 or 5% remove two and a half percent inflation, you get about, let's say, 2% real appreciation with those cycles, with those bubbles in the past. And here's that remote work boost, and then that sideways or our parallel motion in half the market, in the condo side, while the single, I'm sorry, in the single family side, 
my bad, as the condos kind of languish as people try to sort it out. When you put the neighbor islands in this picture, where the condos are in resort areas and uh, are not as prominent, uh, right? The, the condos in Honolulu are urban core condos, a disproportionately large share uh, owned by residents. They're the affordable, relatively affordable housing segment uh, for residents in Honolulu. You just don't see as large a, a post-pandemic surge. And I don't know, is this a bubble? Or, you know, but definitely a bigger, uh, a larger amplitude post-pandemic move in those mm -hmm. neighbor island prices. So yeah. again, the story here, condos are kind of in their own private Idaho and uh, whether it's because people who work remotely prefer to have a bigger house, a home office, a yard in which to go outside and clear their head after a crazy Zoom meeting, uh, or um, whether it's something that has to do with the challenges that face particularly older condo towers in Honolulu. Yeah, probably uh, a combination uh, of both. The factors is at work. Yeah, for sure. Okay, Paul, let's shift gears. Let's look at closed sales and the statistic we look at to determine if we're in a buyer or seller's market, which is months of remaining inventory. Okay, Paul, and we're going to look at the Honolulu Board of Realtors closed sales. We'll start with single family homes. We can see the year to date figure compared to 2023 is actually up compared to 2022 is down compared to pre-pandemic 2019 down about 30 percent on the condo side we see that it's down compared to 2023 while single family homes are up compared to 2022 down 35 percent compared to 2019 down only 17 percent it's interesting to me to see that because it's not that far off from where we were 2019 as far as volumes go um anything that you want to bring up regarding closed sales no, I mean, we're down 15 to 30 percent. I mean, that's that's got to hurt. And that, so it means there's upside, you know, as rates uh, as rates improve. But yeah. let's let's move on and I'll come back okay. to this point. And Paul, talk, talking about rates and closed sales, of course, there's a relationship, right? As rates oh, come well, down, we're going to expect sales to begin to increase the pace. Yeah, I think the you know, the, we were talking earlier about this idea that Rates aren't going to. Rates are moving down. They're just not moving down. What mathematicians would call monotonically. They're not just going to go smoothly down. And you'll remember this chart. We've looked at total sales, single family plus condos on Oahu, and then we've inverted the mortgage rate. So we're sitting here at six and a half percent. We think we're going to go down to five and a half, five percent. Maybe if we're lucky, into the high fours. But the point is that this path is not going to be a straight line. It's going to be, you know, two steps forward, one step back. And as a result, the sales volumes should be higher, should get back towards, you know, let's say 2019, if that's what you want to be looking for as a benchmark. But it's not going to be smooth and, you know, unidirectional. It's going to move yes. and fits and starts and there'll be windows of opportunity. And I think both sellers... And buyers should be thinking about, you know, timing a little bit. I mean, I, I like Andrew's advice. If you see a rate you like, if if it works, you know, you got to think about the long term here. If you see a rate that you like, think about the long term. But at the same time, both sellers and buyers might be wise to look at the zigs and zags as we go. Because there'll probably be, you know, a couple good zigs and a couple good zags every year for the next two years as we move towards normalcy. Maybe there's an opportunity right. for both yeah. buyers and sellers. Yeah. And I always like that that chart that you have that really tracks the interest rate with the uh, the sales volume. It just shows you a nice uh, objective crazy. look it, at it. it. It doesn't actually, it. <laughs> uh, I, I kind of cheat because I've never found a picture. <laughs> I've never found a time in which it tracks this closely, but man, you got to love the way that's so, so tight. So, right. 
Yeah, that's a good one. Okay, let's uh, look at months of remaining inventory. And this has yep. been the the way that we determine, are we in a buyer's market or seller's market? Okay, and this is the latest information from the Honolulu Board of Realtors, months of remaining inventory. I'm going to go back to 2019 to kick this off. And Paul, just to remind everybody, equilibrium between a buyer and a seller's market, roughly around four and a half, maybe five months of remaining inventory. Anything above that would be considered a buyer's market. Anything below that would be considered a seller's market. So we go back to 2019, we can see 3.5 and 3.9. This would be indicative of a seller's market uh, for both single family homes and condos. We see the big drop uh, as we head into the pandemic and the low interest rates, 1.9, 2.0, clearly a seller's market. 2023 continues to be a seller's market, both single family homes and condos. And now we really start to see the separation. That's what we've been talking about all day. Mm -hmm. um, single family homes at 3.4, that would be in the zone of a seller's market. Condos at 5.2, you're now in the area of a buyer's market. You're at the low, low spectrum of that. But I think that that number is going to increase. What do you think? Well, again, we've said this a couple of times already on this show, but we, we, you know, condos have their own special issues. Some condos, the newer condos, probably not so much. The resort condos on the neighbor islands, maybe not so much. There's a vacation rental thing going on there, but we'll see how that plays out. But yeah, the difference between three and a half and four, that's a lot. I'm sorry, three and a half and five, three and a half months of inventory on the single family side and more than five on the condo side, that really says something about condos moving into a zone where it's, uh, you know, maybe like I said earlier, maybe buyers ought to be taking a look. I, I just caution slightly. We live in a different world from the one 10 years or 20 years ago. We have data on this stuff now for about 25 years. And I mean, in the mid 1990s, we were looking at 24 months of inventory remaining. So, you know, not 2.4 months, 24. So yeah, those days are over, but they're also different because we have guys like Zillow out there and we've, you know, we've got these apps where you do your mortgage applications. So it's possible that the velocity, that the equilibrium transactions velocity is actually a little faster now. And you might expect that the zone of inventory remaining would be a lower a little lower than it used to That's be in the past. Yeah. I'm just throwing that out. Um, pretty and soon, I know if we, you know, if you'll we look get on your market, phone and ask, you, you, when yeah. you start asking your AI to go out and find a house for you and they come back in a half hour with 10 good ideas, you know, we'll, 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 We'll have to start yeah, thinking about how that market. I think works. it's yeah, that's that we're there right now. Um, and if we look at market segments, I just recently looked at the Waikiki condo market. That's mm. sitting at five point eight months of remaining inventory, clearly yeah. in the sellers excuse me, in a buyer's market zone. And there are specific buildings in Waikiki, uh, some of the buildings that would cater to the uh, condo hotel market. Those we're looking at you know, 15, 20, 40 months of remaining inventory at one building. So certainly it's all across the board there. You have to be a little careful in that segment just because of the vacation rental brouhaha. Right, that's right. All right, well, Paul, um, it's always a pleasure. Um, enjoy hearing your insights uh, into everything today. So thank you very much. And uh, a thank you to Anders Hostelli and Rate Mortgage for coming on sharing their information and uh, supporting the Hawaii Housing Report. So until next time, be well, be kind, and aloha. And vote. <laughs> Please. Go vote. <laughs> okay. All right, everybody. Bonus clip. Okay, and we're back with economist Paul Brubaker. Now, Paul, talking about the interest rate, you identified a risk premium, which was a spread between the Treasury bill 10-year risk-free rate versus the 30-year fixed mortgage rate. And historically, if I remember, it was around 1.75 rose up to somewhere around three in 2023. Where is that now? And how would that affect rates as we go forward? Yeah, let's pick up where we left off. We were just looking at that 10-year yield coming down, but then it backtracks. So this V right here 
is just what's happened in the last couple of weeks. The underlying path is probably down a little bit. It's above four. It'll probably end up, you know, three and a half to four. It doesn't have that far to go, but that's the risk-free basis for the mortgage rates. And what happens is when something crazy like a pandemic happens, <laughs> The risk premium widens out. And I have a long list that I'm not going to go through. We'll do it another time. I have four things on my list that explain why. And here's the historical data. It's been crazy in the past, but this is not the 70s. You know, This is a period of extraordinary economic disruption globally, an extraordinary inflation, one we hadn't seen for 30 or 40 years, and an extraordinary monetary policy response. The Fed raising rates in 2022 more than it had in the lifetimes of half the population of America. Half the people in America had never lived in a time when interest rates went, as, went up as much as they did in 2022 and 2023. So the way to think of this premium, the difference between the mortgage rate and that risk-free 10-year treasury note yield, the, the way to think about that is just uncertainty. What the hell is going on? And then, as I say, technical factors. Now, from 3% in the summer of a year ago, 2023, and late September, early October, I we just looked it up, it's 238 or 239. It's gone from 3, let's call it to 2.4. That's 60 basis points lower. Mm -hmm. And it's got another 60 basis points to go before it gets in the equilibrium zone. I expect that that risk premium will be coming down, even if interest rates writ large, even if the Treasury yields and the Fed and all that stuff doesn't come down further, the risk premium itself is slowly burning off. So there's that's another 50 basis points baked in. Right that's there. very good news. Right. I, I completely get it. So even if nothing else happened, treasury bill stays at the same place. If this risk premium alone comes down, that's 50 basis points on the mortgage interest rate. And okay, the icing you. on the cake is that something is going to happen. The Fed's going to, kind of going to continue yes. lowering the overnight rate. Right. Okay. Well, that's good news for buyers, sellers, and everybody in the business.